Well, welcome once again. Our topic this morning is true education. The story is told of a young child who, at the age of two years, could read English. At the age of four, he was typing original work in French. At the age of five, he devised a formula whereby he could name the day of the week for any given historical date. At six, he projected a new Legartham's table based on the number 12. He entered Harvard, a distinguished university, at the age of 12 and graduated with distinction before he was 16. This boy obviously was a genius. His intellect was above average. But his father did something different. His father was himself a graduate in psychology at Harvard, and he believed in awakening the child, uh, in the child of two years old, a love for learning, a love for knowledge. He said that if you started early enough and you worked intensively, by the age of 10, a child could have acquired enough knowledge to equal that of a college graduate. And that's what he did for his son. But as the story goes, when the son was in his early 20s, he distanced himself from his parents, shunning the public's eye and wanting a normal life. It's a tragic story when you read the details. But what's sad is that so many of us, to a lesser or greater degree, are seeking to follow this father's example in pushing our children in intellectual training before it's time. But what is education? Some say it's book learning. Knowledge. I went too fast. Sorry about that. Some say it's book learning, knowledge, skills, training, intellectual culture. What is the purpose of education? Make money, get a job, support yourself, get a degree, make a name for yourself. These are all common thoughts on education. There's a push to do something with one's life, to be someone. And it's true, we should want to do something with our lives that is worthy. But in seeking life's purpose, are we seeking for our own ambitions or what God really wants for us? Where are we getting our ideas from about education and about life's purpose? As Christians, we know the right response, right? As Christians, where do we get our ideas from? From the Bible, right? From God's Word. But when it comes down to that practical application of what is education, what is learning, what is life's purpose, do we really believe that we can get that answer from God's Word? And are we really practically doing that in our lives? Education, the process of learning to attain knowledge for a useful life. Well, if, our, if education is to attain knowledge for a useful life, what is a useful life? What is the aim of life? What is life's purpose? The purpose for which all training should aid in fulfilling. John 17.3, we're going to use this scripture throughout our presentation this morning. John 17.3 tells us, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. If you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs chapter 9. 
And we're going to read verse 10. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. In Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, it says, The knowledge of the holy is what? Do you have it? The knowledge of the holy is understanding. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. Turn to Jeremiah 9. Jer Jeremiah chapter 9. And we're going to look at verses 23 and 24. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24 says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this. What is it? that he understandeth and knoweth me. True education isn't about gaining wealth or wisdom in the eyes of the world, but true education is the knowledge of God. This knowledge is the foundation of all true education and of all true service. The Son of God was appointed to come to this earth to take humanity and by his own example to be a great educating power among men. His experience in man's behalf was to enable men to resist Satan's power. He came to mold character and to give mental power to shed abroad the beams of true education that the true aim of life might not be lost sight of. So Jesus came to this earth to give us true education, to show us what true education is. And in showing us what true education is, it was for the purpose of following the true aim of life. So let's look at the true aim of life a little closer. The aim and object of life is not to secure temporal advantages, but to make sure of the eternal advantages. What are those eternal advantages? John 17, 3. Read it with me. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The great object of life is well defined in the old catechism, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To make the possession of worldly honor or riches our ruling motive is unworthy of one who has been redeemed by the blood of Christ. So to make worldly honor our focus of education is what? Unworthy of a follower of Christ. It should rather be our aim to gain knowledge and wisdom that we may become better Christians and be prepared for greater usefulness, rendering more faithful service to our Creator and by our example and influence leading others also to glorify God. So what are we talking about? True education and the purpose of life. As Christians, we have a different aim, a different purpose than those who do not know God. The world says, gain knowledge so that you can be someone, so that you can make a name for yourself. But we have a different purpose. All training, all education is to help accomplish the purpose of glorifying God and bringing souls into his kingdom. This is the purpose of life itself. If our education is not showing us how to glorify God and how to bring souls into his kingdom, how to truly serve him and be those missionaries, then there's something wrong with our education. 
and we need to evaluate what that is and change it. Have you ever heard people say, why are our children leaving the church when they grow up? Why aren't they staying in there? Why, oh, here we, we send them to our church schools or we've taught them Bible stories, but why aren't they staying in our churches? What's the reason? Let's look. We're told plainly, the reason why the youth of the present age are not more religiously inclined is that their education is defective. In America, when it was just being, um, when people were just coming over from other countries, the pilgrims fled their homelands, we read in history, to seek freedom of religion. And they came to America to find that freedom of religion. And for a time they found it. But we see today that we're losing our freedoms, our freedoms to worship God to the dictates of our own conscience. Why is this? In a book called Studies in Christian Education, it gives the history of the educational system and it says that those pilgrims, when they came over to America to seek freedom of religion, they made one great mistake. And that great mistake was keeping the same educational system that they had been taught in their homeland. And we, as we trace the history of the educational system, we see that that is setting the foundation for us to lose our freedom. Now, we know that true education in essence is knowing God. We read statements to that effect. This is life eternal that they might know thee. Does this mean that in our education, when we train our children, we're just to take the Bible and sit down and read to them from the time they get up until the time they go to bed and call that a fulfillment of education? No. We know, as we even study God's Word, that scientific knowledge is important. We need to learn things such as math and science and history. But how are we learning it? True education does not ignore the value of scientific knowledge or literary acquirements, but above information, it values power. Above power, goodness. Above intellectual acquirements, character. The world does not so much need men of great intellect as of noble character. What's the one thing we'll take to heaven? Character. Our characters. So how important that our education is forming the right characters in our children. So above scientific knowledge and literary acquirements, character is most important. The world needs, it's, it continues, the world needs men in whom ability is controlled by steadfast principle. How many can truthfully answer this question? What is the essential education for this time? Education means much more than many suppose. True education embraces physical, mental, and moral training in order that all the powers shall be fitted for the best development to do service for God and to work for the uplifting of humanity that sounds like the aim of life right remember what's the aim of life it's two things to number one glorify God and number two to bring souls into his kingdom so true education embraces the physical, the mental, and the moral training, right? We're told that right here. And you can see the truth of that statement when you look at the development of a child and um, the things that we're called to in life. We need that practical training. We need the spiritual and we need the mental. We need to have our intellectual uh, faculties cultivated, but not missing out on those two other uh, aspects, which is the practical and the physical. And all this education in those three areas 
is to do what? It's to fit us for life's purpose. To glorify our creator, to do service for God, and to uplift humanity. The quote continues, to seek for self-recognition, for self-glorification, will leave the human agent destitute of the spirit of God, destitute of that grace which will make him a useful, efficient worker for Christ. I think of my great aunt. She was um, a simple woman as she was growing up and then she married into a very wealthy family. But she never went to college and, and got her degree and she regretted that for all of her adulthood. And I asked her why, what was the purpose? Why, why did you want to go to college? And she said, well, through my experience, people would ask me, what college did you go to? And I didn't have anything to tell them. It wasn't about learning, it wasn't about what she could do with the knowledge. It was just that she didn't have that recognition of others. And it reminded me of this quotation, to seek for self-recognition, for self-glorification will leave the human agent destitute of the Spirit of God, destitute of that grace which will make him a useful, efficient worker for Christ. Our focus in learning is not to make a name for ourselves, but to make a name for God, to glorify his name and bring souls into his kingdom. How are we going to do it? John 15, 5. Without me, Jesus said, he can do how much? Nothing. nothing. We can do nothing. So as we see the principles of true education, we can't do it of ourselves. But we can as we submit our hearts to Christ. He will give us wisdom to follow his truth out. Without the vital principles of true religion, without the knowledge of how to serve and glorify the Redeemer, education is more harmful than beneficial. When education in human lines is pushed to such an extent that the love of God wanes in the heart, that prayer is neglected, and that there is a failure to cultivate the spiritual attributes, it is wholly disastrous. Wow, that's amazing. So education is wholly disastrous when it's pushed to an extent that the love of God wanes in the heart. Hmm, that's something to think about. And then it goes on with a more powerful statement. It would be far better to cease seeking to obtain an education and to recover your soul from its languishing condition than to gain the best of educations and lose sight of eternal advantages. So wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that if I am seeking to gain knowledge and learning, I'm, I'm going to school and seeking knowledge, and I'm starting not to value spiritual things like I should, I'm starting to lose my connection with God, that I should stop? It says it would be far better to cease seeking to obtain an education and to recover your soul from its languishing condition than to gain the best of educations and lose sight of eternal advantages. It sounds like there's something more important than book learning, isn't it? The knowledge of God must be our foundation. I would not cease in any case uh, I would not in any case counsel restriction of the education to which God has set no limit. So learning is not wrong. We need learning. We need book knowledge. That's not wrong. Our education does not end with the advantages that this world can give. That's a key. Through all eternity, the chosen of God will be learners. But... I would advise restriction in following those methods of education which imperil the soul and defeat the purpose for which time and money are spent. Education is a grand life work, 
but to obtain true education it is necessary to possess that wisdom which comes from God alone. The Lord God would be represented in every phase of education. How many of us adults, as we've been trained, can look back on our education and say, when I was learning addition, I learned more about God through addition. Or what about when I was learning to spell in school? Through those spelling words, I learned more about the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. When you look back, can you see that in your education? Most of us can't. Most of us can't. But it says the Lord God would be represented in every phase of our education. Every phase. You mean even in addition? Yes, we're going to see how that's even possible. But let's review. The purpose of life is to do what? Glorify God and bring souls into his kingdom. Win souls for heaven. All education should help us know God better and fit us to accomplish life's purpose. This is, in essence, true education. So if our education is not seeking to glorify God and bring souls into his kingdom, then something needs to change. Something needs to change. Book learning is important, but it's always with life's purpose in view. True education includes the physical, the mental, and the moral training. Those three aspects. Let's give an example so that we can understand this better. I learned multiplication in my education, in my learning. So I learned multiplication. That's the mental training. I'm developing the mental faculties. I will double my recipe when making lunch today and use what I am learning in multiplication. That's the practical, right? I'm just practically usually what I learned in that book. But we don't stop there. We say, what can I learn about God's character or my spiritual life through multiplication? As I faithfully serve God, he promises to do what? Multiply his blessings in my life. And that's the spiritual, the moral application, the moral training. We can learn all this even in multiplication. That's exciting. We don't just have to fill our minds with these facts. I know for me, I did not enjoy math when I was uh, receiving my schooling in those early years. I did not enjoy it at all. But when I went to the kitchen and started to have to double my recipe, sometimes triple it for a large group that we were having over, it's like, oh wow, I think that math was useful. So I got to practically apply it, and I understood it better with that practical application. But then, it didn't need to stop there. It needed to go further, that third step, right? Which is the spiritual. What did God want to teach me about multiplication and his character? If I don't apply the practical and the spiritual, have I received true education? I haven't. I've missed out. I've just been copying what the world does. The world sometimes even uses the practical application, don't they? But of course they miss out on the spiritual. We want all three in our learning. True education is to help us know God and in knowing Him, glorify His name and bring souls into His kingdom. So I learn multiplication in a book. I apply it in the kitchen. Perhaps I invite others over to my house and serve them the meal. Thus I'm using those multiplication things that I learn in school to witness for him, for God. It's a witnessing opportunity, right? And then I see more of who God is and what he wants from me through multiplication. 
Thus, multiplication becomes the means of glorifying God and bringing souls closer to Jesus. That's fulfilling. That's profound, yet so simple. Mental, physical, and spiritual training. This type of education prepares us to be useful in this life and in the life to come. It makes us well-rounded, and most of all, it helps us know God. What's our scripture? John 17, 3. Let's read it together. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The first great lesson in all education is to know and understand the will of God. We should bring into every day of life the effort to gain this knowledge. To learn science through human interpretation alone is to obtain a false education. So this tells us right here what it is to have a false education. It's to learn science, to learn that academic subject through human interpretation alone. So you mean to tell me if I sit down and I just do my math problems and get up and never apply it practically or never learn about God through that, I'm obtaining a false education? That's what it says. But to learn of God and Christ is to learn the science of heaven. The confusion in education has come because the wisdom and knowledge of God have not been exalted. Let's look at some examples in the Bible of true education. One that came to my mind was David. David was but a humble shepherd, trained in the home, but he was the anointed of the Lord and became the ruler of Israel. Where did he learn how to be the ruler of Israel? Where did he learn how to do that? in the home, training those sheep. God taught him just what he needed to learn to be the ruler of Israel. What about Joseph? Joseph was taken from his home as a young child, yet we see in his life that there was great fruit, that he became a success. He was but a child when taken to Egypt and made a slave in Potiphar's house. Yet because of his early training, he excelled and was placed in charge of all of Potiphar's belongings. And eventually he was made the governor of Egypt because of his early training, because he received true education. Another favorite example of mine is John the Baptist. He was one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. Yet he received his training where? In the desert. We're told in the natural order of things, the son of Zacharias would have been educated for the priesthood, but the training of the rabbinical schools would have unfitted him for his mission. God did not send him to the teachers of theology to learn how to interpret the scriptures. He called him to the desert that he might learn of nature and nature's God. Wow. So John the Baptist, the greatest prophet, could not be sent to the schools of his day because it would have done what? Unfit him for his purpose. What is our purpose in life? To glorify God and bring souls into his kingdom. So John couldn't be sent to this very schools that were supposed to train for this purpose because they had been corrupted. So God had a different way of educating him, taking him back to that original plan. Jesus is our example in all things and he's the, the next example I want to share with you. We learn from his childhood and as we study 
his life, that he didn't go to the schools of his day, was his education balanced? Was it extensive enough? Well, let's look at some of his occupations. We're told that he was the great physician. Where did he learn how to be the great physician? In the home, through nature, through the experiences of life, and through God's word. He was also the mighty counselor. At Uchi Pines, we have lifestyle counselors who work with people who come for our 17-day sessions, people who are suffering, who are dying of cancer or diabetes or what have you. And so uh, a counselor comes and works with them. Jesus was the mighty counselor. And he wants to train us how to be mighty counselors as well. Where can we learn it? Do we have to go to a university to learn it? We don't have to. He can train us if we have a willing mind and heart. Jesus was also a carpenter. He learned that from his father's hand. He had what we'll talk more about later, an apprenticeship with Joseph. He had that on-the-job training. He learned a trade. He was the great shepherd, the master designer, an interpreter, priest, leader, commander, governor, ruler, deliverer, judge, king, teacher. He was all these things and so much more. He received his training with true education. We are told all wondered at his knowledge of the law and the prophecies. And the question passed from one to another, how knoweth this man letters, having never learned? No one was regarded as qualified to be a religious teacher unless he had studied in the rabbinical schools. And both Jesus and John the Baptist had been represented as ignorant because they had not received this training. Those who heard them were astonished at their knowledge of the scriptures, having never learned. Of men they had not, but the God of heaven was their teacher, and from him they received the highest kind of wisdom. I'm reminded of a story that I heard recently. We had a man come to Uchi Pines and um, present a series of presentations and he told this story and I, I was just impressed with, with the lesson that it conveys. He told about his wife who had received only a 10th grade education. She had never gone to college or, or done any other type of training, but God had a purpose for her life. And after she married, they moved to Africa and spent 10 years working there. And when they first arrived, they were um, placed to oversee a, a medical clinic. And while they were there, uh, there was a doctor who would be spending just a little bit more time there with them, who had been running the place, and then he was going to go on um, to another location. And so he took the wife and he taught her everything that he knew. He taught her to pull teeth, he taught her to suture wounds, how to treat the sick and the dying. He taught her everything that he knew except one thing, and that was how to deliver babies. Well, it wasn't too long after they were staying there that a woman came and she was in labor. She was going to have a baby at any moment, and she told the wife that she was going to have to deliver the baby. And she said, well, I've never done that before. I haven't been trained. I don't know what I'm doing. And she said, well, I'm not leaving, so you better learn. So the husband, he went into their small library, and he pulled a book off the shelf, and he opened it up, and there was one chapter in there about how to deliver babies. And so he gave it to his wife, and he said, you better read this. It'll help you. And so she took the book, and she read the chapter, and she delivered that child successfully. From her time in Africa, those 10 years, not a week went by where she didn't deliver a child. Sometimes up to five children in a week. How many did she lose? How many do you think she lost? She didn't lose one child. Before every delivery, she would kneel down and she would pray, Lord, 
give me this child. Teach me how to make this a success. And God answered her prayer. Yes, she read the book. She, she did what she could to obtain knowledge. But she knew that her source of wisdom came from God. Another story along the same lines with that lady was there was war in Africa, in different parts of Africa, and she had a burden to go and help the people with what she knew. And she wasn't sure how she was going to do it, but she just had a burden. And, and so finally she went to the place where they would give her papers to go to the, the new location, and she talked to the receptionist at the desk, and she told her of her desire to go and help the people. And the lady said, well, what do you have to offer? And she said, well, I can speak several languages. I, I know how to treat um, sickness and uh, suture wounds and pull teeth. And she just listed all of her skills. And the receptionist, the receptionist she said, you're just the person we need. Go upstairs and talk to the man in charge, and I'm sure he'll give you the papers that you need to get into the other area. So she went upstairs, and she knocked on the door, and the man let her in, and he said, what do you want? And she told him about her desire to go and uh, work with the people and help them, and he said, well, what do you have to offer? And so she told him all of her skills, and he said, well, what degree do you have? She said, well, I don't have a degree. I have a 10th grade education. He said, you can't go. Because that's how I determine if you have the knowledge. So she was pretty distressed about it all and discouraged, but she went home. And finally, through a series of circumstances, God opened it up and she was able to go into that area to minister to the people. And it wasn't long before she was managing the whole camp that they were in. She was in charge of doctors and nurses and just working extensively and doing an amazing work. Where had she obtained her education? From the hand of God. God had opened up circumstances to give her knowledge and training and she put it right to use. She didn't have to waste years learning things that she would never use or never even remember. God taught her. I firmly believe that if a child knows how to study and is willing to be taught of God and to serve Him, there's nothing they cannot learn. Jesus' life demonstrated the worthlessness of those things that men regarded as life's great essentials. Born amid surroundings of rudest, the rudest, sharing a peasant's home, a peasant's fair, a craftsman's occupation, living a life of obscurity, identifying himself with the world's unknown toilers, amidst these conditions and surroundings, Jesus followed the divine plan of education. The schools of his time, with their magnifying of things small and their belittling of things great, he did not seek. His education was gained directly from the heaven-appointed sources, from useful work, from the study of the scriptures and of nature, and from the experiences of life. God's lesson books, full of instruction to all who bring to them the willing hand the seeing eye, and the understanding heart. True education is not the forcing of instruction on an unready and unreceptive mind. True education is not merely taking a certain course of study. I know many people who go through grade school and universities, they can't spell, they can't do very many practical things, but they have a lot of intellectual knowledge or a certificate that says they've completed a course. But have they learned anything? Can they use it? 
it's not, true education is not merely taking a certain course of study. True education is a grand science, for it is founded on the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. True education is that which will train children and youth for the life that now is and in reference to that which is to come, for an inheritance in the better country, even and heavenly. True education is a knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, whom he hath sent. True education is the intellect inculcation of those ideas that will impress the mind and heart with the knowledge of God and the Creator, Jesus and Jesus Christ, the Redeemer. True education is religion. True education is missionary training. True education is the power of using our faculties so as to achieve beneficial results. True education is well defined as the harmonious development of all the faculties, a full and adequate preparation for this life and the future eternal life. True education is the preparation of the physical, the mental, and moral powers for the performance of every duty. We're training our children to be useful in this life. It is the training of body, mind, and soul for the divine service. This is the education that will endure unto eternal life. True education is mental, physical, and spiritual training gained to accomplish life's purpose. Romans 12, verse 2 tells us, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. As we learn about how to train our families to be useful in this life and the life to come, sometimes it's not understood. Sometimes it's not even accepted by those around us. But that doesn't matter because we want to be accepted by God. And in the end, just like with Jesus, they'll say, never a man spake as this man because never a man lived as this man. I hope that we will determine as families to give true education to our children and as individuals to truly educate ourselves for life's purpose. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have given us an outline in your word on the purpose of true education that we don't have to go through life and be unuseful and just seek for self-glorification, but we can truly help others. We can truly glorify your name as we cultivate our mental and physical and spiritual faculties. Please teach us how. I pray for each person here that you will bless them and guide them, that they can be your instruments in this life. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen.